Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate. Today I'm interviewing... Alvern Baum. Hey there, how are you doing today? I am good, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to chat today. So can you tell me about your books? Sure. Um, my next or newest book that is coming out is called um, Blue Religion. Mm-hmm. It is a crime drama about a... Um, a former chaplain turned homicide detective who is investigating the murder um, of a rookie police officer and a civilian and uncovers a conspiracy that dives deep into the blue religion of the Chicago CPD. Um, so yeah, I, that's without giving it away, I guess that's the mm. best way to, to uh, talk about it. And this book is so good. Anyone that listens to the show knows that I love a good thriller and um this book was really just so excellent. And it was even more special for me because I live in Chicago. Um, and so reading it, I was like, oh, I know that place. I've been there. Um, and that was really interesting. That's awesome to hear. <laughs> How did you decide on that location and like setting it in Chicago and using the places that you did there? Yeah, I grew up in Chicago too, so I'm a Chicagoan. Um, nice. I grew up on the west side of Chicago, and um, one of the things um, that I wanted to talk about um, when writing the book was the idea of um, just Chicago as not only this place, but as a character, and it's mm. specifically the west side of Chicago, um, which I find that when I was writing or reading about Chicago and other crime mysteries, it was always on the north side of Chicago or the, or, you know, the south side, but nobody ever mentioned that the west side of Chicago and all these different cultures. So um, for me, it was just about writing in a place that I knew and that I wanted to talk about and and also um, giving um, readers something different, another side of Chicago that they hadn't probably seen or read. Mm, I really love that. And like, you're right, like what you said, it always is set in the north or the south side and it's always the same couple of locations. Um, And here you really go into more depth on that kind of stuff. Oh, well, yeah. Well, and thank you for that, because I really wanted to show um, readers, not only in Chicago, but outside Chicago, that there's so many different layers to Chicago, you know, mm-hmm. and in the surrounding burbs or whatever. But as a city, there's just each like like in, if you talk about New York and the different boroughs, same thing in Chicago There's different neighborhoods really accentuate and make Chicago what it is, you know, a hundred percent. Yeah. How did you know that you wanted this book to be about um, a homicide detective and like talking a lot about the Chicago Police Department? Um, So I kind of fell into it. Um, I thought it was always going to be um, the character would always be like an amateur P.I. And Mm -hmm. um, somehow when I started writing the first book, um, Only the Holy Remain, he just it just took on this essence or this presence of of wanting to work in CPD. Um, and so, um, I always talk about this duality that I have with, um, with writing about cops and then being harassed by cops and, Mm -hmm. and, and, and then having friends that are cops or family members that are in law enforcement and having this duality of a, like a love hate relationship. And I think, um, ultimately the character in some way, I think Frank chose to be a homicide detective, whereas I thought it was always going to be this amateur PI, but it just, somehow it just came to life and I found myself being more intrigued about talking about um not only about the duality of their love and hate relationship but the duality of being a cop and what it means to serve and protect but you know and to also have a society that in some ways that hates you for doing the thing you're supposed to be doing but mm-hmm. if you're not doing it in the proper way then you understand why sections of society hates you or dislikes you because you're not doing the job that you're supposed to be doing. But if you're doing it right, you still fall in that, that fringe or, or that gray area of like, you know, do I let the job consume me or do I actually rise above and become better than the job? You know? Yes. I, I think that's really interesting what you're saying about like the, finding that duality. Cause that was really shown in the book. And I was before we got on, I was, I was going to actually bring that up to you and say, like, I really loved how you handled that showing like, even, um, I, I don't want to give anything away, yeah. um, but even like this family that he's close with, they still don't really like cops. And he's like basically a part of this family, but they don't, they don't have that 
trust and it's so understandable and he understands it. And that was something that I I really loved how you showed that and how you showed that they were not necessarily in the wrong too. Yeah. 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 And that, that, that always, that always gets me because it was just, like I said, it's something that just, it, it, it just came back. And at this point it just, it was something that, that happened organically that I wasn't even thinking about it. Um, when I was thinking about plotting the book or whatever, it's just something mm-hmm. that kind of organically happened. And before I knew it, it was there on the page. And I was like, Oh, I guess we are going to talk about this because <laughs> that was not yeah. planned at all. <laughs> mm-hmm. So now you've also written graphic novels, right? Yes. Yes, can, that is correct. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Yeah, my latest graphic novel was called um, Across the Tracks, uh, remembering Black Wall Street, Greenwood, and the Tulsa Race Massacre. Um, they came out in May from Abrams um, um, Publishing Comic Arts slash Megascope. Um, so that was a book basically about the 100-year anniversary and about um, the people that created and made Black Wall Street um, mm-hmm. as successful as it was and the destruction of Black Wall Street. Um, I also write, I kind of in every kind of genre when it comes to comics and graphic novels. So I do a, um, I wrote a, um, a choose your own adventure, um, graphic novel called Dime, uh, about a, uh, an, a PI who has to investigate the murder of, um, this, um, this Harris, this husband and uncovers this, um, you know, secret society, um, of, um, I guess of killers, I guess you can say. Um, Mm -hmm. I've written about werewolves and uh, the first female werewolf hunter who was hunting the father of all wolves in 1605 France. Uh, So I I guess, yeah, yeah, it's called Virgin Wolf. And it's basically, it's based off a true character. Um, It touches on American history, but it's said in 1605 France about this young woman named Virgin and a Native American mentor who are hunting the father of all werewolves. And you find out that, you know, touches on a lot of um things in history that throughout history there have always been werewolves and there have always been this these hunters and things that you're um so yeah I, I kind of write a lot of different things when it comes to comics and graphic novels um so yeah it, i i just run this gamut of things it's like whatever i'm interested in, i go write um and i just uh recently just adapted orthello into Ooh. a modern day tale um it's a graphic novel told in iraq about orthello being this marine um, captain who um, who's stationed in Iraq and he's teaching um, or training Iraqi soldiers as they prepare um, to evade Raqqa and fight against ISIS and he falls in love with a young Iraqi woman and is by an Iraqi soldier. Um, so again, Orthello. <laughs> the so more cool. of Iraq. Oh my gosh, as you're describing all these, it just makes me want to go and like read them all right now. Um, there's not enough yeah. hours <laughs> in the day. Um, I know. <laughs> That's really interesting, though, about how you do so much um, genre vending and how you go into all these different like types of stories. Um, do you have a favorite that you've like world kind of that you've written in before? Um, right now, I think my favorite might be the next. Uh, so I have a novella series coming out next year from Sacramento Press called um, The Butcher. The first book is called The Butcher of Edaway. And mm-hmm. it's going to be a series of novellas um, set in this world called the the Apothecary Mysteries, and it's an illustrated um, crime fantasy novella. So it has Ooh. elements of like Game of Thrones mixed with what I would call um, more like um, SVU kind of thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you want to come on the show to talk about that, you are welcome. <laughs> yeah, anytime, that sounds fantasy so cool. <laughs> yeah, and I'm having so much fun because it's about these two detectives. Um, they're called crows, um, crows of the apothecary. And uh, the the society believes in magic, but also science. So it's alchemy and apothecary combined. And these crows are detectives, medieval detectives, who are sent to this town um, called Edaway, in which they are there to apprehend this butcher um, who is who has been murdering people. And it turns out that the whole town, though, is made of butchers. It's a society of butchers. And so they have to kind of discern and, and investigate these murders, figure out who amongst the society is the real killer. And um, what they uncover um, will lead them down a deep rabbit hole of more conspiracies. But yeah, you know, but I, I, I just wanted to bend the idea of two 
two genres I, I really like um fantasy and crime and I just I've always liked fantasy from a distance I've never written it so mm. it was kind of cool to kind of bring these two um I guess a love of all three because there's illustrations in the book so it kind of brings that graphic novel feel to it also um but yeah that'll be coming out um sometime next year uh so I think that's what I'm doing right now that I think this I, I just like doing it. it's so much fun that creating sounds- these new worlds and new characters that sounds really amazing. Um, so, like I said, if you want to come on and talk about that, okay. you're welcome anytime. Um, yeah. Um, so, talking a little bit more about Blue Religion, in contrast to your other writing, what was it like um, writing long form stories after writing so many graphic novels? And, like, what were some of the biggest differences that you noticed? Well, uh, so it's always the opposite in some ways for me. Like, so, I write all my prose longhand. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, I write it with a pack. Um, so for Blue Religion and Only the Holy Remain, um, it, it it takes me longer to write those things just because I, I first have to write it out longhand. As with graphic novels, I jump between the two. Sometimes I'll start longhand and then I'll go to the computer and then I'll jump back and forth. And the only time I never have to write longhand is when I'm writing screenplays or teleplays. Mm -hmm. That's the only time I never have to write longhand. Um, So one of the things that um, when I'm writing longhand prose novels is that there's a lot more description that I have to get on the page, you know. Um, Whereas when I'm writing graphic novels, I can say um, this character Mm -hmm. looks like this, you know, and really don't have to describe it as much. Or this character and this character in a room in this panel. And then I can leave it up to the artist to kind of make up what's going to be in the backgrounds, the smells. The, whereas when I'm writing prose, like I'm literally, it's like a movie and I have to feel it, I have to taste it, I have to smell it. So I'm trying to bring all of those different senses onto the page um, mm-hmm. for the reader so that they feel that they're in that moment with that character as much as possible. Totally, yeah. Um, so how did you find that out about yourself that you have to write prose longhand? Uh, I think I've always done it i've kind of always done it but um i remember um i when i sat down on blue religion because i wrote my first novel longhand i used to write it on the train in chicago and then i would stop at um one of my friends bars and just sit there every night and just write um and write the book um but then um when i started to do blue religion i tried to sit down at a computer to write it to type out the first chapter and it didn't feel right and it just didn't feel right. And I was like, okay, something like it sounded good, but it there was something missing. And then when mm-hmm. I went back and read it, I realized that there were things in the room were on us in that like that first opening chapter when you know when you open up in Frank's um bedroom that um I couldn't see or uh, that I couldn't hear or feel. But when I'm writing with a pen, it just feels like the pen's connected to my brain and the brain's connected to the pen and to the pad. So everything's like one natural flow. Um, yeah. So I realized um, that's when I started to realize that, OK, yeah, I think I like writing better with the pen, even with this, this like this new novel that I'm writing that's based in Chicago. Um, I, I typed out the first chapter um, and I was like, yeah, this is good. And then I went to try to work on the next chapter and I was like, something's missing. And I realized mm-hmm. that it's because I like writing longhand that I feel more connected to the world and to the work when I'm writing longhand. That makes total sense because I, I I under I like totally get what you mean with that. How it's like you're almost more connected to the words that you're writing when you have it like that, and it's so, something so physical. Um, with me, I I struggle with writing longhand because it connects to like my brain too much, and then I get distracted and I just start <laughs> writing random words. Yeah, I think that's in some ways why I do it because I like the idea of like writing in the in the um and the border of the page and, you know, and then just mm-hmm. like writing around words, maybe circling and, and writing arrows and saying, Oh, look how this connects to this. And whereas I can't do that in the computer, maybe I can do it on like on a tablet now, you know, now that the writing has become better. Uh, I actually want to try that. See if I can mm-hmm. write a whole novel digitally through a tablet and see how that may feel. But I like the idea of being able to just jump around in a, on the page and kind of connect if I see it. And most of the time I never see it. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, since you do write longhand, do you outline your work or do you just kind of go at it? No, I outline. I outline in a way that um, I found that after I wrote the first novel, um, I outline by chapter. Um, mm-hmm. Usually I'll, I'll write out, like I'll put a number and I'll say, um, 
okay, this is something I want to touch on in this chapter, or I'll, or I'll start seeing the story as a movie. And so um, normally I'm just writing out like what, what each scene, what I, what I see as a scene. And then I'm like, oh man, okay. And then I'll, once I start writing, I try to follow those, those chapter headings. So usually how I write is it's by one word. It's usually a word will come to me and that word will spawn off into another word. And usually a word will spawn off into a whole story. So usually I have like chapter headings of things that I think I want to talk about. Like I'll say chapter two will be the blue religion, you know, and mm-hmm. I'll like, so what does that mean? And I'll try to, as I'm writing, I try to figure that out. Um, but usually how it's, it's, in, and it's organic now that I think about it. Um, when I'm writing, even if I'm plotting, if I outline everything from chapter one through whatever in chapter, somehow um, when I'm writing or it just organically starts to come together in a way that I don't even realize I'm writing it. Like, you know, since you read the blue religion, mm-hmm. you know, that like um, there are moments where, like you said, where we were talking about this duality of having a family and, and, having this job. And, and that's something when I wrote the plot or the outline, that's something I had no idea was guy I was going to touch on. It just kind of organically happened. Yeah. That was actually one of my favorite parts of the book. I'm so glad that that um, oh, made it in. Cause it was so interesting. And I, once again, I don't want to spoil too much, um, no, no. but hearing that kind of stuff and like seeing in that, I think, I believe it's like one of the first chapters when he's um, going back to hit the house at uh, their apartment um after a day of work out there like and then it's really intense and it's kind of like a break in the story almost and it feels like how he describes it in the book which is interesting like it I, I don't know if I'm saying this right but it kind of put me in the headspace of the character where it's like you just had this really intense thing then it's like oh now they're like hanging out and making dinner and like yeah he or like the moment, and it's yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, oh man, you just put it in my mind. Like the mo- first moment when he comes home, and he looks down at his keys, and he realizes mm-hmm. like he has the extra key, and he's like, he's like contemplating or debating, do I use it? Do I not use it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. I lo- I I really loved that. Um, yeah. Um, were there then, any? See, that was something I never thought that's or- that organically happened on the page. Well, it, it was a very special moment that I found while okay. reading Good. it. So I'm re- very glad that it did happen. Um, so were there any books that influenced Blue Religion or um, any of your other works? Um, I have to say, I think Michael Connolly's, um, can't think of the Harry Bosch book. I mean, it was some, some years ago, but that had a um, that had a, a great influence. I, mean, I can't think, I think it's called, God, why can't I remember the title? But it's like after Harry Bosch comes back after being a detective, he goes away and then comes back and he starts working like um, these unsolved cases. And it just hit me that like that was like a powerful read for me. There was another book by um, a Chicago author called Michael Black. Mm-hmm. Um, his first novel, I don't know why all these titles are, um, are um I can't think of what the name of the title, but it was his first novel. And I read that and that gave me um, permission, I guess, in some ways to write about the world that I wanted to write about. Because what I did when I first started Only the Holy Remain, I think I read um, like five different authors' first novels because I wanted to understand um, what how they wrote and what they were writing about. And Michael Black, I had a real conversation with him once. I ran into him and I had a conversation about his book telling me that that book became the thesis for his graduate um mfa and i was like oh so you did it and it, and it gave me permission to write only the holy remain as my um mfa and that that was actually how frank became um how i started from so yeah i forgive me if i'm from I'm bad with titles no no it's fine that's that's really interesting i think and you were descriptive enough about like the author and whatnot what book and stuff so people can go check those out um but i think that's that's fascinating i I never knew that you could have like turn in a a book for your mfa yeah yeah so my mfa was um i had a i was was, it's in literature so i was Mm -hmm. doing a literary short story collection and then um after i talked to michael i was like you know what i'm changing it I have to write what's in my head. It wants to come out. And I convinced my professor at the time. I was like, look, it's either I'm going to write this book or we're going to be here for another two, three years. 
and it's going to take me some time to write this, this short story collection. And um, after they read it, they were like, okay, okay, this can be your MFA. This can be your, this can be the thing, you know, your, your thesis. And I was mm-hmm. like, thank you. Thank you. And so kind of how I started in to crime fiction. That is, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I never heard of that before, but that's so cool. Did you know when you wrote that, that it was going to, um, spawn this series? I did not. Um, so what's funny is, um, only the Holy Remain was the first book written a book before that, or was starting to write a book called sins of the father. And it, and the, it was just a detective. I didn't know who he was, didn't really have a description of him. And um, I had written like probably like 10 chapters of this book. <laughs> and I realized that um, in those 10 chapters, there was just like stuff happening, but there was really nothing going on. I didn't know who the character was. And then um, I wrote um, Only the Holy Remain as a short story. And my friend Vanessa Angone at the time, she, um, asked, she goes, what happens next? And I was like, what do you mean? It's a short story. She's like, Clearly, there's more that could happen. And when she said that, I was like, oh, what does happen next? And so that I started writing the novel. And then in writing the novel, um, Frank kept itching. You know, he was like, hey, I'm here. What are you going to do with me? And um, there was, um, and then all of a sudden I knew, before I knew it, I was writing Blue Religion. And as I was writing Blue Religion, something came back to me and it was like, hey, you remember that, 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 we started writing called Sins of the Father. And I was like, oh my God, everything, there's moments in Sins of the Father now and then I'm like, that's going to be my next Frank Calhoun novel. And I was like, oh my God, there, there's crimes in there that can touch. And I was like, oh my God. And, and before I knew it, um, I come up with like two more books. So uh, my next two books are, uh, you know, are going to be Frank Calhoun crime novels. And um, so now I know what the third book is going to be. And I know what the fourth book is going to be because I've already written the um the um what do you call it the not the prelude but the the prologue i guess Mm -hmm. to book three um it was just something i woke up one morning like i had a dream about it i woke up and i just started and i wrote out like a couple sentences and i figured out what the prologue is going to be for the book three that's going to push us into book four and i was like i guess i'm writing two more books so yeah that's how it happened so apparently i'm writing four books um so there'll be sins of the father and the fourth book will be um, a cold heart soul. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> that is so cool. Well, I will be like reading those as soon as possible. Cause that sounds <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> um, right first, yeah. <laughs> and there's so much um, to do with this character too. Totally. So like, yeah. I, I understand what you mean. I was, I was a little sad at the end cause I was like, Oh no, there isn't going to be anymore because I wasn't uh, I didn't realize it was a series I do that a lot yeah I didn't realize it was a series either <laughs> and I was like oh no there isn't any more I like I wanted to spend more time with this character you know um yeah and so that's really exciting to hear that that there's two more books on the way <laughs> yeah there's breadcrumbs apparently I left in the first that I didn't realize until I started writing um blue religion but there are breadcrumbs in the first book only the holy remain Mm-hmm. They're about to come back in the third that's going to shine light on everything. You Basically blows up everything we thought we knew about Frank. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Well, um, when that comes out, if you want to yeah. come out and <laughs> chat about that, Def- we can freak out about all the Easter eggs that got resolved. Right. Um, <laughs> so do you think this is kind of a, a different question than what we were just talking about, but um, out of all of the different mediums that you've written in, is that, You've written a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. Did you? Ha- do you have a favorite that you found? Um, I think I, I, I've always just wanted to write novels more than anything. Mm-hmm. Um, comics was a hobby that I kind of fell into and fell in love with. And with movies and TV, um, that became a thing of like, I've just always been a viewer from the distance. And when I started writing TV, I just fell in love with it because I realized that TV comics and prose they're all to me they they all work in the same vein so but i've always just loved writing novels um i think tv might now be my second favorite it may even be my favorite and now i'm working on a new working on two new pilots right now um, and so yeah I'm, i think yeah tv might now be my new favorite that's and awesome. then prose may, but prose will always be my first love i think just because that's always what I've always ever just wanted to do. I just wanted to write a book. 
<laughs> everything, all, all these other things just kind of happen. Um, thankfully, God has, has given me the talent or the ability to see story in different mediums, but mm-hmm. I've always just wanted to write books and, and hopefully take it from there. That's awesome. Yeah, I feel like um, that's something that I hear a lot, like on this show and stuff where it'll be like, oh, I love writing in all these different areas. But then they have everyone has kind of has one that it's like this one will always be like my special one. because it was yeah. like the first. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been so excellent to chat with you. I just have one last question. And that is, what do you have coming up? Um, besides um, the Apothecary Mystery Series, um, I'm also um, I'm working on my next crime novel. It's going to be a standalone. It's called um, Waddy's Love. And it's about the uh, between 2010 and 2021, um, the 100 plus um, women of color that have been killed in Chicago. Um, basically, some people believe there might be a serial killer in Chicago. Some just think that it's coincidence. So um, I'm writing that now. And then um, I have a, um, a crime comic coming out um, at the end of this month technically the beginning of November, I guess you can say, um, called um, Crook County. Mm-hmm. And that's coming out through um, Sacramento Press. Um, so that will is going to be an awesome um, crime drama set in Chicago. But it's going to be a comic series um, that I'm doing um, with writer Craig Gore, who is um, one, of, he was one of the writers on SWAT in Chicago PD and one of the producers and writers. Um, so we're doing that together. And then um, I'm sure I got something else. Oh, and then I'm... Um, uh, towards the end of the year, I'll be launching a Kickstarter um, where I'm going to be doing a audio drama on from characters that appear in the world of Dime, and oh. it's called The Man with the Sham Hand, and it's basically about um, amateur detective or young PI detective Eddie Puss investigating the murder of this um, brilliant scientist and uncovers a conspiracy that deals with femme fatales. Um, rogue nations are, <laughs> and stuff of that nature set in like this um, quasi um, newer world. Um, yeah. So oh, that I'm sounds so cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. We got, we got voice talents by some great actors. Um, some I can't mention just yet because <laughs> um, oh. they're pretty big name, but it's going to be really cool. Um, so yeah, that's going to come in a Kickstarter. Um, I think at the probably towards the end of the year or the beginning of the year. Yet. I haven't made a decision yet, but yeah, that'll, it'll be coming out soon. That is so cool. All right. Well, everyone go and check out Blue Religion and be on the lookout for all of these other incredible projects that you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. For Read Between the Lines, my name is Molly Southgate. And this is me, Alvar and Ball. Thank you. Let's end this the way all great stories end. Happily ever after, the end. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. This episode is hosted by Molly Southgate. It is edited by Rob Southgate and produced by Southgate Media Group. You can get in touch with the show at readbetweenthelines at gmail.com or you can send us a voicemail at 708-887-9473. That was 708-887-9473. You can also find us on Instagram at readbetweenthelinespodcast. Thank you so much for listening.